Well, the miracles, for example, the miracles. I grew up reading about them, and my grandparents told me, you know, things that they saw in their right. lifetime with Wigglesworth and others. And so he's already done, he, he does more in a week than I thought I'd get to see in my lifetime. We are ready, we're rolling in three, two, one. Welcome to Equipping the Saints with Cheon, and today I have a very, very special guest. Uh, he's been my covenant brother. We've been friends for since really uh, the revival broke out in 1994, but especially year 2000 when we were in Minneapolis together. Yep, yep. We made a covenant commitment to see revival in California. I'm here with Bill Johnson, who's really been my pastor, because whenever I have a major need or a crisis, I call him, and you're always gracious to respond. So, Bill, it's great to have you on the well, show. It's great to be with you. It's good to see you. You know, I know that we've known each other for many years, but there may be people who have never heard of your incredible rich heritage. I've always been blessed because you're talking about generations of pastors, not just Christians, but pastors. But why don't you just share a little bit of your, your story, your history, and your roots? Yeah. I, uh, I'm actually a fifth generation pastor on my dad's side of the family, fourth on my mom's. Wow. So my mom's side has a lot of missionaries and stuff all over the world. My uncle was uh, Billy Graham's right-hand man for many years, and then my dad's side of the family, and all, all Pentecostal background. Uh, they were involved. My grandfather, my mom's dad, was baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1901. No way. Yeah. And so you're talking about Charles Parham. Yeah, yeah. 1901. Yeah. In 1903, my grandmother. Yeah. Wow. And then my dad's parents uh, came in uh, a, a bit later. But yeah, yeah. That's a, no, the, I, amazing this is the first background. time I heard that. It's kind of stunning because we're just celebrating the 115th anniversary of Azusa Street that broke out right. in 1906. Right. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that really the outpouring began around 1901. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah, but I wanted to ask you, though, but you mentioned your uncle was. Uh, Billy Graham's right-hand person, but he's a Pentecostal, and he was working with Billy Graham? Yeah, you know, he, he actually was uh, Amy Simple McPherson's solos for a while, too, one of the solos uh, wow. involved there, too. So, yeah, a lot of unique uh, uh, backgrounds. You know, my, my, uh, my aunt and cousins uh, were baptized in the Holy Spirit under Smith Wigglesworth's ministry. Wow. And so they've just got connections all through all through our history that we uh, admire so You're so much. a prolific writer. Have you written about this, your background, just your, no. you know, your memoir? I think I, you need to share that. I think yeah. it would be great to see how the generational blessing, you know, really to a yeah. thousand generations, the word says. Yeah, it's, it is amazing. It's it amazing is what amazing what God does through multiple generations, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, I don't have the same kind. My dad's pastor, but I know my great grandmother got saved during the Pyongyang yep. revival of 1907. Amazing. And that was an evangelical, not a Pentecostal, but nevertheless, we had evangelicals in our family line until I became the charismaniac <laughs> in the family. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 74. But um, you're named after Billy Graham. Yeah, I am. So a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, my How mother, did that come about? Oh, my mother met him uh, through my uncle, of course, that worked for him, uh, worked with him. Uh, my mother met him like two weeks before I was born. And so they uh, really admired him and Billy Sunday both. Mm -hmm. So that's my name is not William. It's actually Billy. Yeah, right. Bill. You know, everyone calls you Pastor Bill or Bill. And uh, it's amazing, the rich heritage. Now, I know that you and I both had tremendous encounters in Toronto in 94, that wave, that hit. But... I got saved in 73, and I know that God called you around the same time during the Jesus People Movement. Yeah. How did that revival impact your life, and how have you stayed fresh, really being a God chaser and being in the presence of God all these years? You know, uh, the major change came in my life through Mario Murillo's preaching. No way, he, yeah, really? he was a frequent guest. My dad was the pastor. And, uh, and I would just go anywhere to hear him. Even though I, I hadn't made the big yes, I wanted to be exposed. I could, I could tell I was hearing absolute truth. And, yeah. uh, and it was through his preaching. I just I remember one Saturday night by myself, uh, I just said yes, all in. I didn't care if I ever owned anything, accomplished anything. It didn't matter. I'm, I am a full-on disciple of Jesus. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's never been renegotiable. Yeah. You know? But you grew up uh, in the church and you knew the Lord. 
but it was almost like a like a revelation of lordship that you just had this yeah. other encounter. What, I, I, I don't know how to, at that time. I don't know how to theologically fit it in. I was no. 18, 19 years old. And I, all I know is that everything changed that night. You know, wow. everything changed. I, I, I literally went from someone who hated to read, hated anything to do with study or learning or anything overnight to a disciple, to a learner, to a, a, wow. a, a, a real follower. And it was just a change that happened inside of me. I just became hungry. Wow. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's part of the uh, the the blessing of the legacy that yeah, uh, for sure is yeah. on yeah. your your parents and and uh, three other generations of pastors beforehand. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that I just want to thank you, but uh, I've been so blessed and a lot of people say that you're one of the most revelatory mm -hmm. teachers. And when we hear you, you know, it's hard to digest because you're just speaking one revelation, one truth after another. And uh, sometimes it, we get kind of, it gets kind of comical because you want us to say amen and we're trying to digest the previous sentence that you said <laughs> that we can't even say amen to what you just said, uh, the last thing you said. And so how do you spend time in the presence of the Lord and how does the Lord give you this revelation? Well, what was your uh, devotional life like or is it your study time or what? You know, my my study time literally is just reading. It's yeah. just reading the Bible. It's reading and rereading. I'll take a book and read it, you know, fifty times, hundred times, or whatever. I mean, I just I go over it and over and over it. Um, and God will just speak to you, and it was just some things from Christmas. Most of the time, He speaks to me, not when I'm reading. After I've read, you know, after you, you put in the deposit, then right. I'll be driving down the street or talking with a friend. Doesn't matter where right. it is. He starts putting pieces together. And uh, but but what what has mattered most for me is I don't read so that I can teach, I don't study to get a sermon. I don't. I think that's, that's really important. Just, what you're saying, yeah. It's not a part of my routine. If yeah. I have an hour to pray, I'm usually going to take probably forty minutes or so just to worship. Yeah. Forty five minutes. If I have ten minutes, I'll take six or seven minutes just to worship. Right. But the point is, is is for me. I'd rather maintain that healthy connection to the felt presence, the felt reality of God with me mm -hmm. more than anything else. And in that, I discover his heart. Right. When you discover his heart, then he shows you stuff. Right. And so for me, that's, that's it. Uh, probably the key for my life is my affection for God. Now, did you learn that on your own or was someone a mentor or did you see the model by someone else, like your father, whatever, that no, uh, caused you to have that kind of, um, that attitude, that mentality and approach to the presence of God. I'm sure many people did around me and I, you know, absorbed their example, but nobody instructed me. And it was more of what I learned to do early on as a pastor, honestly, for my survival. Because if you, if you, every, if you feel, if you live under the pressure to do things for ministry, you, you get exhausted. Yeah. But if you do it for the journey, the relational journey with right. God, then it's always life giving. It's always strengthening. And and so that's that was the distinction I made early on and really for my own survival. Yeah, right. But, it, but oh, it's become yeah. it's become a way of life. Yeah, yeah it really is a life in the spirit. And, yeah. and uh, but, uh, you know, I asked the question of how have you stayed fresh? Would this be part of this? Yeah, absolutely. Of just staying in the river. Just, yeah, it's just it's just the the um the ability to to rest and delight in him mm -hmm. and to worship to to uh to not live under that performance thing you know i mean I, i've got work to do you know we all have responsibilities sure. and, yeah. and i i'm not an irresponsible person i'm not looking to get out of stuff but uh but i i have i have found that Finding that place of real connection with the with the reality of His presence. It's the whole abide in me, let my words abide in you. Ask whatever you will. The way that we shape the course of history through our prayer life is through living in that acknowledged presence of God right. and consciously having His word resting in our hearts. And right. So anyway, it's that's a key uh, a key portion for me. So yeah. when you talk about reading the word, you're talking about really just reading the Bible, or you're talking about reading other books during that time, or uh, you know, even uh, maybe uh, reading articles on online. Well, I, I do all of that. I, of course, I read uh, books and mm -hmm. stuff, and I write them. You know, I mean, sure, I, right. so I, I believe in in uh, in those things to be right. a great help. But primarily for me, it's the, it's just reading the word. It's just reading. You know, years ago, John Paul Jackson made a comment that uh, Romans chapter four would be very key for this next wave. 
So I, I took every day, besides my other reading in the Word, I took every day for three years to read Romans 4. I missed it five days because of international flights. So I, I, after I landed, I, right. I read Romans 4. But the point is, is it was the Word, so I'm going to be exposed to it. Yeah. And so I read it just every day for three years. Right. And uh, just to become inundated, you know. What, what you want is, as Lance Walna would say, you want it to become cellular. You want it to become a part of who you are. Right. And that's what I need. That's what yeah. I need so much. You know what this is so encouraging because anyone can do this. It's Absolutely. not like you're a pastor. Absolutely. You're not doing it for a message. Nope. You're just doing it for your own survival, you said, <laughs> but really just spiritually to yep. grow because we're a spiritual being and we have to feed our spirit. For me, it's John 15. You mentioned John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever yep. you wish will yep. be given to you. But to me, that is one of the most powerful chapters for me yes. because it's just talking about abiding in the vine and intimacy and it really is about prayer for me because it's just listening to the Lord, yep. uh, His Word, not only the written Word, but the revelatory Word, yep. and also just uh, talking to Him in prayer. Yeah, I agree. And so that is uh, such an encouraging thing that we want to just encourage all of you. If you're out there and uh, you're just feeling dry, look, it comes down to just basics, you know, and it's not brain science, you know, it's like... Uh, you know, just everyone can get into the Word and, and meditate on the Word and talk to yeah. the Lord and pray the Word and allow the Word to be in your life. And amazing thing is that favor follows you. Ask whatever you wish, it shall be given to you. And you see an extraordinary favor. You're not seeking the favor, but you're seeking Him. And it's, it's Matthew 6, 33. Yeah. 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 Tell us some of the breakthroughs you've seen in your life that went beyond even what you asked for. Well, the miracles, for example, the miracles... Or, you know, I, I, I grew up reading about them and my grandparents told me, you know, of things that they saw in their right. lifetime with Wigglesworth and others. <laughs> right. But, uh, but I, I didn't see them unless I went to Catherine Kuhlman a meeting, uh, Mario Morello. We'd see things happen with yes. him, but never as a normal part of church life. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I just, I lived with this, this weighty conviction that it was supposed to happen, but it just never happened where I was, you know? Yeah. He does more in a week than I thought I'd get to see in my lifetime. Isn't that amazing? It is, yeah. It's completely amazing. It's just become amazing. like normal Christianity. Well, it, it is. Even though it's extraordinary what God's doing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And that's that's fun. That's that's amazing. In the healed lives, you know, to see. I remember a guy came up to me and says, Do you remember when you prayed for addicts uh, on a Sunday night here about six months ago? And he described that. I went, yeah, that we invited anyone with an addiction to come forward. And we had about 10 people in a, in a little group there. And so the whole church just prayed over maybe five minutes and they went back to their seats. And he says, yeah, my friend and I were heroin addicts for over 20 years. We both got set free that night. Neither of us have had any desire to go back to uh, taking drugs again. And it was just a corporate prayer. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, one of uh, our pastors, uh, Gavin um, Barrett, he got healed of a uh, cystic fibrosis just at Bethel, went to a leadership conference. Wow. wow. You gave a word of knowledge and he was instantly healed. Stunning. But, but I want to ask you, what's probably one of the greatest miracles you've seen because you've seen so many? What what stands out? Um, we had a, 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 a young boy, I think he was 11. Uh, he was from Norway. Uh, the doctor advised the family, he's the only child, the doctor advised the family to do a final event because he was dying. He, his body couldn't absorb food. They mm -hmm. fed him intravenously at night when he slept. He's in a motorized wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he couldn't, uh, his body just wouldn't receive food. And he was dying. And so the, the doctor advised uh, one last family outing before he dies. Yeah. And, it's uh, like a make a wish list. You know, yeah, we have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In America, it, yeah. It, it was that, and and they had never been to Bethel. They heard about it, but they were just trying to avoid any kind of a long trip. But it yeah. wouldn't leave their mind. They mm. finally looked into it, and the doctor didn't even know if, if he would survive the trip. Mm. And uh, and so they they sent him with like three hundred and fifty kilos of medications and mm. and medical supplies, and uh, and they they came to Reading and uh, sat sat in the first day of a meeting. And uh, somebody, he was in a breakout session or something. Somebody asked, does anyone here need a miracle? Several people raised their hand. Uh, there's one of our students went over him and said, what's wrong? He says, I, I can't eat. They pray for him. Uh, a little while later, they're out to uh, Olive Garden uh, having lunch and two families together. And they would always give him food to play with, to smell. So they gave him a, a breadstick because let him be a part of what's going on. And, uh, and so he asked for another one. They said, no, we already gave you one. He said, it, I don't, it's gone. 
<laughs> so what did you do with it? He said, I ate it. And he had been completely healed. They, wa they watched him. It's a, it's a hilarious story. They actually made a movie in Norway. CBN did an interview with him. So yeah. But a, just extraordinary uh, miracle. Everything changed. Everything changed just instantly. You know what I love about the story? It wasn't like you prayed. No, It was exactly. just someone nameless, faceless, prayed for that person, how yeah. God can use every believer because these signs That's follow the yep. those who believe. That's the point. Yeah, I love that. You know, uh, it reminds me of um, uh, Peter Wagner um, has a colleague, another professor, former missionary, and uh, his daughter had adopted a child from Central America, and they intentionally adopted a child with no ears because the oh child my. was handicapped and they oh knew that no one would adopt. And so, but you know, when they brought the child over from Central America, they wanted Peter to pray because Peter has a healing ministry. Of course, he passed away in 2016. So he prayed, he didn't expect much. And so they went to Marie Calendars in Pasadena right after prayer for lunch. And all of a sudden, the, the, it got really quiet, the husband and wife, because each of them were seeing ears grow out. Oh, my goodness. And they said, are you seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> You're kidding. That's awesome. <laughs> they said, yeah, I didn't want to mention that because I thought maybe I'm seeing something. And sure enough, it grew out to two ears, not fully grown, but perfect in their size. And he could hear this oh, child. Oh, my goodness. And um, Peter writes about that, of course. And it's probably oh, one of the great goodness. miracles of just, you know, <laughs> things that sometimes wouldn't that even works. believe that's going to happen. That's amazing. <laughs> There's some of the biggest miracles I've seen. I didn't expect it. I didn't have faith for it, but yeah, God just, still has yeah. love and it, compassion. Absolutely. And yeah. how do you um, encourage uh, churches to develop a culture of the supernatural? Because whenever I go there, I just feel the presence. I feel the, the, the Bethel Church. Um, but I know that intentionally you've, uh, over the years, worked on developing a culture to allow the Holy Spirit yeah. to be the Holy Spirit. Well, that's that's. That's it. First of all, is you give him you give him place to do what he does, mm -hmm. and if you wonder what his heart is like, just read the Gospels. Yeah, right. You know the uh, right. the leper said, "If you're willing, you can make me clean." And Jesus made the declaration, "I'm right. willing. This is my will." That's right. And uh, and so we we have to make room for and expect what Jesus did in Scripture, mm -hmm. because he he is the same, and that just means we take risk. It means we create room. It means, here's what I do. In private, I cry out to God. In public, I take risk. Mm. And it's that combination. And when there's breakthrough, he gets the glory. When there's no breakthrough, go back to prayer yeah. and pray again. God, you've got to increase that breakthrough on us. Because when you minister to people, it's, it's, it's uh, Acts 10, 38. Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil because Amen. God was with him. And so yeah. you just get alone with God and you cry out once again. You put yourself on the altar and say, God, you've got to do something with me, with us, whatever, whatever it takes so that Jesus is glorified through, through, this, uh, through these miracles. Well, that's amazing. But I want to shift gears a little bit because we we're both in California. Yeah. And, um, and uh, this is not to dishonor Governor Newsom, but um, if we didn't sue... The state of California, Governor Newsom, will still be locked down in-person worship because 49 states had opened churches for in-person worship. And the and, uh, only reason why we open is because we want a Supreme Court decision uh, in uh, February, you know, 6-3 yeah. uh, decision. And so we've seen this progressively extreme left. Even right now, as we're talking, schools are not open. And what's so crazy is that uh, because of the immigration problems, they have bus immig immigrants, and they are teaching these kids in person, but not our citizens who are paying taxes and, and parents are being frustrated. So uh, so anyway, I bottom line is that we need revival yeah. in California. What's been your thoughts about California? Because you've lived here all your life, and you've seen so many changes and uh, you know, I, I was thinking, I hope you're running for governor. No, I just, <laughs> no. <laughs> you don't want to lower yourself from the, your calling. But, yeah, but, uh, but uh, yeah, just give me your sort of yeah. thoughts about oh, uh, and anything God's spoken to you about California revival. Well, I, I feel like we need to think in terms of 20 years, that we've got 20 years to turn things. Mm -hmm. And it's by taking a, a generation that's growing up, challenge them to become lawyers, judges, professors, school teachers people that are in the places of uh, decision because 50 years ago Jesus people movement everybody thought Jesus was coming back right away and we 
we gave up some of those roles right. to uh, to people that uh, that were unbelievers and had no values. Right. And so we we just positioned ourselves for, for the return of Christ right. and not to do what He said to do, occupy till I come. Right. So uh, that's I think that was the huge mistake is we gave up uh, the responsibility that we had to not just have you know people have greater faith for the return of Christ than they do the power of the gospel. Right. And that's and that's where we need to have we need to have both. Yes. Where we absolutely. where we believe that the gospel will transform an individual, a family, a city, a nation. And uh, we've got to yeah. have that here. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. Uh, but we know that we have more evangelicals in California than any other state except Texas. So Texas is number one. And yet we see the difference between Texas being conservative, uh, you know, restaurants opened up. Business opened up. They didn't really lock down the church. And here we've seen this progressive uh, uh, draconian measures in California. And uh, to me, I'm not pointing the finger at the government. I'm pointing the finger at the church yeah, because yeah, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. It's true. So give me your assessment of uh, what what is it that we have just uh, checked out uh, of our responsibility because what you said was so important, but what's your assessment of that? We, we just have an unhealthy view of the sovereignty of God. If something evil happens, we just uh, say, well, God can use it. And yes, he can. He's big enough right. to use anything. He can use a Hitler if he wants to. Right. But, but the point is, what is his will? And that's our mandate in life. Right. Our mandate is on earth as it is in heaven. That has to shape what we contend for. Right. It begins in prayer. It's followed by action uh, where we take very specific steps. Uh, we learn to think so that we can communicate and dialogue with people, uh, have intelligent conversations, not just emotional reactions to things we don't like. Right. Because that's, uh, you know, those become sound bites against us, used against right. us. Right. And, uh, and we just we just have to refigure how we approach this thing. And we've got to get involved in what's happening in the government, agree. everything. One you know, of the things that I um, have just noticed uh, because, um, as you know, the pre-millennial, pre-trip rapture, or mid-trip rapture theology, eschatology, is that things will get worse and worse, and then Jesus will exactly. rapture us exactly. out of here. And so with that kind of theology, why even bother to vote? I mean, you know, what we're That's seeing exactly in society right. yeah. in California, this is fulfilling scripture and prophecy, and just beam us out of here, Lord. But I, I feel that is a new theology. That was not in the early church. This was something that came in the 1800s and uh, got popularized by Schofield Bible, uh, B.B. Warfield in uh, Princeton Seminary in the early 1900s. And, and of course, you know, we're talking about dispensational cessationists who don't believe even in the supernatural, and yet they believe in this pre-trip, mid-trip rapture, which has really influenced all the churches in California in a big time way. Yeah. And so I feel like that is sort of handcuffed people. You know, so we need to preach the yeah. truth and no. set people free to be engaged. Yeah, if people receive awkward encouragement through evil. <laughs> the church does because yeah. it's a sign of the times. Right, it just exactly. means he's going to return soon. It's just, it's a perverted way to yeah. approach the last days for sure. Oh, yeah. And, um, and the thing that really, um, I think, grieves me is also we've had this uh, Greek mentality of dualism, you know, and like... This world's passing away, do not be of the world. The separation of church, state, secular, sacred, when they break mentality, everything is sacred. The earth is the Lord's yeah. and it's foremost there. Yeah, and we're absolutely. to be involved in every aspect. And I so appreciate you talking about education, not just, you know, the government mountain. We need professors, we need chancellors, we need to take back the universities that have gone so extremely left. Yeah. They're teaching kids uh, that your parents are racist. You know, I mean, yeah. Charlie Kirk, uh, I was privileged to speak at a conference with him in, uh, uh, before the lockdown in January of 2019, uh, 2020, actually, the February uh, is when we uh, started to get word about COVID-19. But in this conference, he said, I met a parent, the kid, a freshman, went to college. When he came back from Thanksgiving, he didn't want to have dinner with them because they were racist. And he learned that at his university. So yeah. here we're paying thousands of dollars exactly. to teach our kids to dishonor your parents because they're racist. I mean, what in the heck is yeah, going on yeah. in America? Exactly, you know? exactly. And so we need to take uh, the government mountain, we need to take the media. Uh, Hollywood is so woke, you know, I, I I wish I could have time to even talk more about it. But you know, we only have a short 
few minutes, Bill, and I want to go back to what I said that uh, we want to pray a blessing, yeah. uh, maybe a word of healing for those who are watching, and you could just yeah. pray as the Holy Spirit leads you. Yeah, absolutely, we'd love to. Okay, yeah, I, there's first of all, I want to just pray for an awakening in the church. Uh, you know, we, we've got to repent for complacency, and I, I'm, I'm not a harsh uh, pastor that's constantly looking for people to to cry in front of me to encourage me. Um, I'm just looking for change and accepting responsibility. So I just, I do, I pray that, I pray that all the believers that are watching this uh, would wake up with an unusual gift of wisdom to articulate truth. The cool thing about truth is it is reasonable. I mean, it really is. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. It's, it's, it is the answers for family life, for finances, for all these things. They're, they're very reasonable, and they are the things that we have. They're the tools that we use to, to shift and change culture. So I pray for that real gift of wisdom, uh, understanding of culture, understanding the day that we live in. But I also pray, Father, that you would release an anointing for the miraculous, uh, I just pray for children, childhood diseases. I, I hate every sickness, but I hate especially childhood diseases, those arthritic conditions of small children that get so crippled early in life. And we just declare that is not the heart of God. It is not the will of God. I pray for a release of miracles that God would actually reform uh, bones, that there would be a healing in children, uh, children, uh, even uh, uh, bipolar, um, some of the mental things, um, uh, the dyslexia, the, uh, all the brain uh, issues, um, those things. We just declare the healing word of Jesus. We've seen so many people yeah. healed. I, I'm, I'm sensing an autistic child. Uh, that's what that I was God looking for is the autism. The word. Okay, so it's a confirmation yeah. that God sent forth his word and healing. Your child of autism just claimed that with God, all things are possible. We just heard this incredible miracle Amen. Amen. with this child from Norway and uh, creative miracle ears growing out. And so, Lord can do anything. So, God bless Amen. you. Thank you so much, Bill, for being yeah. with yeah. us. And you got to come back. You're right uh, down the street, you know, or right up the, the street yeah. in Reading. So, yeah. come on down. I'd love to. Thank you so much. Be sure to join us and all of our amazing guests for this season of Equipping the Saints.